not often. Sometimes you do, uh, but I'll, I'll show some more. So, so basically, I'm just saying that most of the operations are the same. So the same here is true of the numbers, you know, plus, minus, division. Actually, modulus is the same too. It's all it's all the same right, over here. So um, a lot of your code you can you can copy and paste, and it's going to work the same way. So other distinctions here, but no triple. That's in the distinction. So if I say that's the same as x equal equal y, you go, okay? So this is like the really equals or super equals, whatever you want to call it. In, in JavaScript, you almost always want to use the triple equals and never the double equals. That means double equals. Code okay. doesn't have this sort of equals idea. Okay. Um, so I just know that. Uh, if statements, how do you do that in Go? Yeah, so, I mean, you guys can log in here and type in the so. <laughs> It turns out uh, you can have parentheses, they're just not required. <coughs> Sometimes they're needed. Like if you if you have multiple like let's say I have a subject or I, you, you might need this as well just to make the order the operations work properly but you don't have to have it. Uh, okay, so that's an if statement. It basically works the same way. I suppose we should also point out the else if you know and else cases just so that we can see that they're the same. So it pretty much works exactly the same. Uh, uh, one one other thing to note is that. In Go, you have to use this format, okay? Um, so in, in maybe I can show that just by putting the, uh, you know, in, in JavaScript, you're free to do different formats for your code, right? I could say something like this, which is a very common coding style. You can't do that in Go. You have to do that style, okay? This style, once you get used to it, is shorter. Okay, so loops. Uh, well, actually, we have uh, we have while whatever in JavaScript. How do we do that in Go? For whatever. Yeah. Can you back up a line? That's right. Use the word for. Take out the parentheses. Uh, are parentheses optional? There you go. Um, okay, so that's that's how you do sort of a while loop can go as you use for. Uh, and then in JavaScript, maybe you can do uh, you know equal zero i less than ten i plus plus. What is the uh, let's see? We have in the loop we have the initialization, we have the check, and then we have the increment. What's the check in the for there without any true? Is that just an infinite loop? There. The next line up, right here. Yeah, it's like for true. So it's just infinite loop. <coughs> okay. That's the same as while true. Okay. Yeah. So it's just that's not okay. So in, in JavaScript we can do this three expression form for for four. How do we do that to go? Our for loop's got to be a function anyways. So yeah, just assume we're a function. There you go. So pretty much, 
Looks very similar. Um, this is kind of a complex expression of for loops. Once you get used to it, it's not so bad. But if you're not accustomed to for loops, it might be a little, you know, like, oh, there's a lot of things going on there. But just recognize that JavaScript has the same for loops. Uh, the, the for loop here is not like a Go innovation. It's just a very common type of loop. Did you take up, did you make it for variable i? No, I, for this, what we're doing is we want to do something 10 times. This is how you would do it in JavaScript. You would not use the for in. Okay. For in is for looping over a collection. No, I'm getting JavaScript. Can you do not by example input? Like, instead of i dot dot equals, do you have to use i dot dot equals? I I for there. Yeah, so this is the same as saying the bar here. So if we change the loop so it was for i equals zero, i less than ten, i less close, and we had you know somewhere above that to our i, the way we would do that in Go is we would do the same thing. Oops. Right? No semicolon. So that's on the colon equal is we create a variable. So it's pretty unusual to create the i variable outside of the for loop. You usually put it inside the for loop. Oh, okay. So another loop you do in JavaScript a lot. Uh, let's call this for name. Some object there that we created, and then we're looping over it. And like you like said, you can use key. And so key here will be x. And so then we say, you know, whoops. Sorry, Taylor, is there a way to see what other people, what's on this? Yeah, so if you log into the, the document. It's on, it's on the main document. Yeah, sorry, it's, it's right here. So in the Wednesday, way down here, there's this, we're making this cheat sheet, and here's the link to it. So if you follow that link, you'll get to this document we're all editing. <laughs> That's not the code you wrote over. Uh, but you're getting the right idea. Yeah, there you go. Okay, and then the for loop, what's the for loop? There you go. And then instead of console.log, what do we use exactly? Pretty following what we're doing here. So we create an object. In JavaScript, we use JSON. And in Go, we use map string string. But otherwise, they look very, very similar. So the only change between these two here is the colon equal and the addition of the type, right? But otherwise, inside, it actually looks identical. So Go supports JSON for basic strings. It's sort of in line with that. Okay. And then the loop is um, for key value colon equal range. And so instead of in, we use But otherwise, very similar. The other change here, oh, uh, change the object key here to value, and you'll be good. Um, we, we could do the same thing if we wanted. If we wanted to do the same thing, the way we would do it is we would take out value here. 
and then we could say obj key, okay? Um, so, so Go has an extra option that makes it so that uh, in addition to the key, we can get the value inside the loop just right away. Um, everybody following that? But otherwise, also notice that when you use an object in JavaScript, you use this, and it, it uses the same thing. Square brackets to do the work. Four key dot dot or colon equals range. You compare that to the four uh, four i colon equals. Uh, there's just no range. It is same as that. But it's the same as that four eight on the left. Yeah. So it loops over every key inside of the map. What's four in it? Yeah. So it loops over. It goes. It gets x right. And so if we had another one in there. Um, It loops over every key in the map. And this does the same thing, it loops over every key in the object. Okay. Uh, other, other distinctions here, um, this could contain anything. So we could have, uh, oops. We could have, you know, why is 10? You're allowed to do that in JavaScript? You can't do that over here, it has to be a string. Okay. Like I said, we'll see today another way to make it so it doesn't have to be a string. But <clears throat> that, that's a distinction. The other distinction here is the order. So what's the order of an object when you iterate over it in JavaScript? Like what does the order of the keys come out? So the order they're put in. That's exactly right. What's the order in Go? Determinedly <laughs> random. It's random. Uh, it's, yeah, so you're not going to know the order. They're unordered. Um, so this for loop will visit every key, but the order it visits them, who knows, okay? And the reasoning go, uh, that people made go one of maps be random was because... Well, typically like a, a, a map is a, it's like an abstract data structure, and the traditional data structure is unordered. So yeah, they don't want you relying on an accident of implementation. They want you to sort of use it as it says it's supposed to be used. Because if you look in the spec, it says it's unordered. Right? But if you happen to make one that is ordered, and I think that is the case with JavaScript, I'm not sure that it guarantees that they come out in order. It just so happens that every single implementation of JavaScript does that. Right? And so when they made Go and they made the language definition, they were like, we don't guarantee ordering, and that gives them flexibility for people to choose to implement however they want. Um, and there's efficiency reasons why. Uh, if, if you're curious, the way that a, a, a map is implemented is using a hash table, and the way it works is basically it uses an array underneath, and it takes in keys and converts them into numbers and puts them into those slots in the array. And so the way that number is generated, there's tons of ways to do it. <laughs> You're a good man, Paul. Thank you. We're in the four weeks of the desert, and you need some kind of oasis once in a while. <laughs> and you are our oasis. <laughs> So there's no guarantee of where it gets put in the array. So the order is not guaranteed. So anyway, in order to implement the, the insertion order iteration, it's just more expensive. This data structure is more complex. And so it's less efficient. Um, and so they didn't want to define it that way. It turns out you don't usually need to rely on ordering of maps. Uh, usually using a map of a look, as a lookup. So you don't care about or order. Every following. Okay, so that object uh, versus map is very similar. Hopefully, you should be able to translate in your head what the, you use them the same way in JavaScript. So, what about arrays? So, let's in JavaScript you can say you know, I'm, and I'm often using x here. X s is the plural of x. X is. Um, that's where you. That's why you. Know. Yeah, it's short. Uh, so, how do we do that in Go? Okay, I think 
kept as equals and new equals. Very close. Okay, so that's how we made an array, but it actually, I should add to this, uh, so let's copy this, and then we do x's.push. Okay, so how do we do that? You guys familiar with pushing? Push is super common in JavaScript. Yeah? So we use a slice instead of an array. Yeah, there's a plugin I think called GoVent, and then GoVet, which is kind of funny. Uh, Vets are code, and anyway. <laughs> and they'll they catch uh, common bugs like that. In other words, it's valid to write it without the equals here, but it's probably a mistake. And so they're just telling you, you probably made a mistake. The append, the first XS there, is needed to tell it where it's going? <laughs> right, so it's, um, this is like, Create a slice using this as the beginning, add these things to it, and then assign it to the variable. Okay. Whereas this is like modify it. But basically we use them very in a very similar way. Uh, so, so when you see this in JavaScript, you can think slice and go. This is a slice. We've just added the type. This go cares about types. And otherwise, very similar, right? And so, it turns out like if you if you think of these square brackets as curly braces and go, you're not far off from what how it works. Okay. Um, so once again, you can often copy and paste a big chunk of the code with minor changes uh, to get your program. Uh, so those are our arrays and slices. We did maps. Um, what else do we have with, with JavaScript? Uh, did you guys do require? No. no. How did you guys include code from other? We just added the HTML. Yeah. So there's an example of something that doesn't really exist in, in JavaScript that we can totally do in Go, and that's the import. So how do you do that in JavaScript? Well, you know, it's something like uh, add to head script. <laughs> it's very cool for NJS. And inside of format.js, there's something like, uh, you know, FM, uh, FMT equal print line as a function. That's what is inside of this file, right? And so we're just going to include it like this, and then there'll be a global object we can add. In Go, we write import FMT. It does something similar, right? So in inside of FMT.go, there's just you know, a bump. following. So this is a similar idea. Um, you know, here it's more explicit what we're doing, and we're sort of including it, and it sort of combines all the files together and runs it. Uh, here, the, the use of format is explicit. We use import to do that. Now, there's another way to do that in JavaScript, is with require. Um, in in Node.js, you do this. You'd say var fmt equal require, um, and that looks a lot more like import. Okay, uh, but but you can't you don't get this for free with JavaScript. You have to have this as a plugin for your code. So, uh, you can do this in the browser. Browser, uh, yeah. There's there's a bunch of libraries out there that will do this for you. Browser, as there by or Webpack or some others uh, that allow you to do the Node.js style. Uh, 
not required. You know? But so that's how we use libraries. Let's see. So we have the basic data structures. We've seen the more complex ones with the arrays and maps. We've seen how we import code. Um, that's any other things in JavaScript you want to know how you do in Go? We saw how we created a function. So we saw that. WebRTC. Yeah, we're not going to do that. Um, but we saw this. Oh, I suppose we didn't show the. Uh, <coughs> in JavaScript, you can say, right? And in Go, you can say. That looks very simple. Um, oh, uh, while we're on the topic of, of, so in JavaScript I can say, um, did, did you guys do any of this uh, use arguments? Yeah. Okay. Um, how do I do the same thing? So here it's implicit, and we have to be explicit in Go. We have to tell it it takes a very added number of arguments, which is actually better. Um, the implicit thing goes weird. The dot dot set there means any number. Right, it's like the numbers. Um, and the loop is going to be the same as using the slice. Um, another thing that's odd is uh, arguments in JavaScript is not an array. JavaScript does have one cool feature. I don't know if you can do this in Go. Uh, so if I say, this is terrible. You probably shouldn't do this. It, it's becoming clear to me that you're more of a Go proponent than a JavaScript. <laughs> when you just say, JavaScript has one cool feature. <laughs> It's not bad. I like that <laughs> um, That's your iffy, your needly invoked functional expression? No. Uh, so let's see, if we were imp implementing our factorial that we saw before. It's just a needly invoked function. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, uh, and one return n times n minus one. Uh, so then that would all fit. Okay, so this is a really cool thing that it can do that I don't think it can do in Go. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's a way to do this. But <laughs> this function has no date. Uh, I'm calling it via this thing. So you can do recursion with a function that has no name. And that's kind of cool in JavaScript. Um, a recursion with a what? With a function that has no name. Call leaves what calls it? Yeah. Uh, I think that's what they call the Y Combinator. So you know that famous uh, website, Hacker News, Y Combinator, they're a 
investment thing. You're curious, that's where the name comes from. So anyway, Dom, the Dom's group could make it, uh, which is cool. I don't know if you can go. Honestly, I don't know why you, you don't really need it. Uh, just give your function a name. It's not that big of a deal. Um, now, you say it's cool. Are you saying it's cool because it has some good applicability or just because it's an interesting concept? I, I'm saying it's cool because it's like a really advanced piece of functionality uh, that's like hard to implement in most languages and it just so happens that JavaScript has the ability to do it uh, and very few other languages do. So the way you would do this in, in Go is you'd give it a name. And actually we can, we can say, um, we can do it like this. So it looks very similar. We just had to give it a name to do it. Now notice that I can't use colon equal here. Does anybody know why I can't use, for example, I can't do, you know, if I took this, this bit out here, I can't do this. Okay. Right. Anybody know why I can't do that? It's not inside the function. It's not in the function. Yeah, it's a scope without a scope. Uh, because this function has only access to things outside of it. This doesn't exist yet. It doesn't exist until this is defined. So it can't access this vectorial. Uh, and so we can we can get it a type, and it'll be and this will be uh, nil. So it's not defined yet, but we're telling it it will be defined, and then we define it. But because it's already been defined, we can use it. So if you ever need to do that inside of a function, you can do it this way. Um, but normally, normally we use this format up here the regular defining function like this. And that has the ability to call itself. Uh, so so and if you do it this way, you don't have to give this weird pre declaring it. Can you go to that first line? What if, if you're calling a function in JavaScript on the left has some function, call it, execute it on the right? Wouldn't it just give me some function? Or you have to be, oh, you gotta be inside the I, I was just, this first one is just re reminding you that you have to be inside of the function and go. Because uh, in JavaScript, it's like start at the top of the file and just run everything. And in Go, it's like not like that. It's look for me and then start at the top of me and do everything. Okay. Any other things uh, that I'm missing here about stuff you do in JavaScript and you wonder how you do it in Go? Um, we'll see more of the like, oh, here's how I interact with the DOM. You know, there's a lot of things you can do in Go that are specific to you know, working on a specific problem. And we'll see a lot more of those. But as far as the basic language goes, that's the idea. <clears throat> but hopefully, you can see they're very similar. So we'll keep this around. If you guys think of other things that, you know, when we're going through the up and go stuff, and you see, see an example, and you're like, oh, I know how to do that in JavaScript, feel free to add to this, and it's a nice cheat sheet. Um, OK. So now we can get to our problems. I was hoping we could do maybe pair programming on this. So is it like uh, there, when we did pair programming in the past, there's some people it didn't work so well for. So let's just uh, do like make it optional. Okay. And uh, if you are if you consider yourself more solid in Go, uh, when we start, we could just say, hey, uh, I'm willing to pair program with somebody. I think a good way for it to work would be if you're the more solid one, you go first and you just sort of code out loud and you basically talk your thought process through so that the other person kind of hears how you're thinking about things. And, and then once you're done, the, the more novice person can then go and, and talk their way through and you can correct them when they're stuck. So let's do it that way. Optional, and if you're strong and want to do it, you can self-elect to do it. Okay, and so the, the example problem we're going to use is this first one. So I need to show you how to do the first bit here. Also, user generate profile image from gravatar.com. Uh, you probably don't know how to do that. <laughs> do you have the link for that thing where you're just working on? The, this? It's right here. Okay. 
And this document is in that is good boot camp. Go boot camp. Reads user information from the command line. Uh, sure. From one or reads it from where? I either as arguments to the program or as you can use scan to get it. Um, or some other way if you oh, know, yeah, scan. Yeah. know how to do it. Uh, um, and then we're going to create a profile page. So, but I'll show you the Gravatar thing. Gravatar is a site that does uh, thumbnail images. I used it for like profile. All right. And so the basic idea is you can go to a, a URL, gravatar.com. Oh, that's kind of hard to read. I'll zoom in. Um, and then slash avatar, and then slash this huge hash thingy. And that gives you back an image. One of the neat things about the way they implement this is that they have the ability to specify what happens if it doesn't exist. Um, and you can give it this extra stuff. So do they have an example with it? So it can generate an image, which is kind of cool. Um, In addition, to allowing your own graphic card is never built. Use one of these apps with pop keyword as a D parameter. So, uh, you know, if we have a, a thing that doesn't exist, we can set <coughs> to uh, identicon, and it generates a random image. So, if we if we you know have different text in there, uh, we should get a different image. Maybe. I think they have to be this this special hash. Um, so, the way this is going to look in our Go code, and I'll get you started with the Gravatar bit. Uh, so, we'd make a folder example slash um, profile maker or something. And we create a main.go file inside of there. And we have package main. We're going to be printing out our HTML, so we're going to do it this way. This is going to look a lot cleaner than the way we did it last time. That's the nice thing about using the backticks, is it means we can use new lines inside of our string, which makes this a lot simpler. Um, so part of our, our profile is going to have an image source. It's going to be the Gravatar. Right? So from their docs, we can see we can use this kind of way. So HTTP colon slash slash www.gravatar.com slash avatar. And then we're going to have to insert into here the hash, um, which I'll show you how to do in a second. And this is going to be the basic structure. So we're going to generate, um, so we're going to have to generate that hash. So uh, we'll call it. Gravatar hash. It's going to be a string. Everybody following so far? Hopefully, this is pretty straightforward. Right? We're just generating a string. We're going to dump it to a file, and then we're going to load that file in a browser. Um, so, if I go to bash and I go to my path slash source slash examples and I go to uh, okay, profile maker. I have my main go so I say go install and I run profile dash maker. Now I've generated my HTML. Notice that we're missing the hash. We'll add that in a second. But I just want to make sure everything's working right. Um, so I can write that to a temporary file. So we'll call this say index.htm or HTML. Uh, to use the and then in OSX you can say open index.htm. I think in Windows you can say start index.htm. And this is an HTML page with an image inside of it. That's hitting, getting from Gravatar. Everybody following? Mm -hmm. This is really straightforward. 
To generate the hash is not straightforward, so I'm going to show you how to do that, and you can copy and paste this code. Um, so their docs say that Gravatar images may be requested just from usage, the most basic usage looks like this, slash avatar slash hash, where hash is replaced with calculated hash. So we have to figure out how to get the calculated hash. Um, it works on email addresses. So the way Gravatar works is you upload your profile image anywhere on the web where you log in with your email, you get that nice image there automatically. So it's the idea of they sort of outsourced your profile image. Um, so this is used by Stack Overflow, it's used by GitHub, it's used by lots of sites. Um, and so, but we have to generate that hash, see, because my email address at example.com becomes this, this uh, F whatever. Um, and so we have to write the code to do that. So they describe what we have to do, trim leading and trailing white space from an email address, force all characters to lowercase, and then MD5 hash the final string. The first two things we already know how to do. So does somebody want to help me write that? So we're going to have a function, um, get gravatar hash. What's it going to take? Email address. Yes, email, which is a uh, string. That's right. And it's going to return what? A string. Exactly. OK, so the first thing it says is trim, trailing, and leading white space from an email address. So how do we do that? Uh, I would go to the web and search go lane trim. <laughs> good, good idea. That's very good. That is exactly the right thing to do. And then click index and control F, trim. And there is our trim. Right? We saw this, I think. We actually want trim space. Okay. And they give an example here of how to use it. So we'll just copy that example. Uh, one interesting, yeah, I should mention that. You know, you can model the examples out there too. Uh, the way this works is kind of amazing. It literally takes the source code, sends it to a server in Google, compiles it, and then runs it, and then sends you back to the account. And uses Ajax, so you don't have to reload the page. Exactly. It's right there. But that, that process is terrifying for people, right? It means you're running code that anybody can put on your server. Uh, so they, they feel very confident in their security and they let you do that. Um, so anyway, you can run the examples in the docs is all, all it ends up being which is nice. That's like the, you know, walking through the bad part of town late at night. <laughs> it's like, you know you have no fear. You're the biggest guy on the block if you do that. OK. So I'm just going to save it to the original email. So we're just overwriting, which is OK. Uh, remember, strings are immutable, so I'm not modifying the string you pass in. I'm creating a new one and just overwriting the variable. Um, it doesn't actually matter for our case anyway. Uh, and so that's going to get rid of any spaces. So if I had, you know, whatever at example.com, with a bunch of spaces before and after, it's going to return, at this point, we're going to have um, whatever at example.com. Okay, so we just got it's actually a really cool email address. What's your email address? Whatever at example.com. <laughs> but you probably get all kinds of spam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then force all characters to lowercase. All right. So how do we do that? Email equals, and then I go back to that. Yeah. And to lower. Lower. Returns a copy of string with all Unicode letters after the lowercase. That sounds like what we want. So to lower. Once again, I'm just going to use the same thing. So maybe I should have used something with a capital letter in here show what it does. Now we have with a lowercase letter. And now the fun bit, the MD5. We don't know how to do that yet. But I can I can show you how we're going to do that. Okay, so MD5. Go has a library to do MD5s. Um, so if we go to the package documents, it's in no, no, oh, uh, yeah, it's in, there it is. Crypto slash MD5. And this is going to look really confusing because it's so short. You're like, where, where does it do it? Okay, they, luckily we have an example. But this is going to create a new hash. Uh, so here's our example. We do MD5.new. All right, we can do that. So we're going to do that up here. Well. H colon equals that. 
And when I save it, or app imports, so we've imported crypto MD5 FMT strings. And the only new thing here really is this MD5. We've seen the other two. Yeah. Um, and then the way the hash works, we'll cover later. But for now, we can just use string to H, and then give it the string we want to write, which is email. Okay. So IO is another package. And we're just going to write string to this hash thing. This hash thing is what's going to generate our hash. And then we say h.sum nil. And that gives us our hash. So um, we'll call it final is that. That's not quite right, actually. We'll call it final bytes. And then we have to convert that uh, into string. So because when we look at the example, when it says MD5 here, look, these are hexadecimal characters. So we have to uh, encode them before we send them out the door. So there's a hex library that can do that. So that was all very uh, clear and understandable as you explained it, but if I tried to climb my way through that path and to go to docs, man, that would be like, uh, that would be an afternoon. That would be an afternoon. Right, well, so the process was, I need the MD5, I go look for a package named the MD5 in the docs, and there is one. This part will make more sense when we cover files. Cool, cool, yeah. Uh, but as far as where to find MD5, that was pretty easy. But as far as, well, now how do I use it? That's not as easy. Although the part that would have hung me up is 19, where knowing that it gave me bytes, and now I need to take those bytes and, yep. and turn it into hex, I would have been like, yep. what? So there is a hex dot encode to string, and you give it the final bytes, and that gives us our final string, which will return. Okay. Now, like I said, this part of the code. I mean, we know how to do that. This is like, oh, what, what have I got myself into? But, but you can just use this when you write the rest of our code. But yeah. let's make sure it worked. Uh, so, and that's just new territory. We're going to get to know that more over the next couple of weeks, right? Yeah. Right. Um, though I, I should mention what we're doing here. This program is not far off from what web development looks like every day. Okay, this is the kind of thing we're, we would do if we were doing web development. Is Oh, I need profile images for my website. I'm going to use Gravatar. I go read the docs for Gravatar to see how to do that. And then I have to implement it using my programming language. You're awesome, Caleb. Awesome stuff, man. This is, uh, this is like knowing how to do it at the base level, not relying on something else to do it for you, you know, some level of abstraction in some language. Um, so let's see if this works. I just put in my email address uh, as an example. And we can run the program to see what happens. Oops, got to read the file. There we go. Wow. So pretty rare for the program to work the first time. So that's successful. That's why you're a teacher. Show us your hat, just the number. OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave up this function so you can see it uh, and copy it. And I'm going to walk around and help you guys when you need it. Uh, but I think the rest of the program, you know, this asking the user for their name and email, you should be able to do, okay? And building the HTML. The idea is we're just generating a profile page. So you can clean up that HTML, look at, make it look nice, do whatever you want with CSS and stuff. Um, but we're going to show at least the name, the email address, and their uh, profile image, okay? Yeah. yeah. That's basically all it is. Just recognize this is hex, you have to import it. But if you're using Go Plus, it'll do that for you. Okay, everybody good?